We're very happy to have you here, and I'm, it's been my honor to introduce th these two phenomenal women. One I've known for 20 years, one I've just met. They're both awesome. Uh, let me introduce the one I've just met. Um, I'd like to introduce... Uh, she, uh, t t the, I would, my favorite credits would include American Psycho and The L Word. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Guinevere Turner. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, uh, this next woman uh, right now is a writer on Enlisted, uh, but her credits also include How I Met Your Mother. Please give it up for Teresa Mulligan Rosenthal. Yeah. And I'm going to try to give Stephen Colbert a run for his money. <laughs> um, uh. So our theme is uh, uh, actor, or people who both write and act. And these ladies have done both. And uh, the, I suppose the first thing, just to have a little exposition, is who were your heroes growing up? Like, how, did you model yourself after anybody? Was there anybody that came down the pike that you went, oh... Woody Allen, Claire Booth Luce. Any was there anybody that impressed you? I'm gonna go with Kafka and Peppermint Patty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they said that on the last panel. <laughs> now, um, like uh, at least using myself is a little bit of a gauge. There, what happened to me was I modeled myself after people and then got quickly bored and and made mistakes and and in the wake of those mistakes actually did stuff. I, was there anybody that, you know, what was your first break? Maybe that's a better way of phrasing that. I pray um, that. Mine started at Second City, doing Second City. I felt like that's when I really started writing and doing and performing and having the two work together. Um, my influences were Gilda Radner and Carol Burnett, <laughs> to date myself, um, and uh, Mary Tyler Moore. And I'm hoping I look like all three of them right now. <laughs> um, but you know, that's Second City was like the the when I went. Oh wow, this is I love this. This is what I feel like I'm in my skin now. So um, this is my except tribe. except for doing the imitations of Gilda Ratner when I was like <laughs> nine <laughs> for all my friends. Um, but yeah, that's and then you know going out to L.A. Uh, wrote a one-woman show and that got a lot more attention for the writing than the acting. <laughs> and so that's when I kind of like segued into writing more and started working for MTV. What and is then, that thing that's talking? Yeah. It's really bugging me. Do you hear that? What's happening? It's feedback. Really? I think it's the staff's radio. I, I lack focus. Like it's I really me. need one it's thing talking. to be happening. <laughs> <laughs> what is that thing that's talking? I'm sorry. <laughs> You go. <laughs> no, but did you hear that? I just, I really I can't like, hear it. I'm like a weird monkey. Like, if you, I only can focus on one thing, and if there's something else happening here, I just like, <laughs> I just get, I'm like, um, you know, I'll just start like going down the depth. Maybe have some, we should have white noise. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> we are. This is white noise. Um, Guinevere, what do you, uh, what made you choose this as a profession? And I'm sorry to be so stiff with my question. Um, I didn't, I, I feel like, um, to say something really boring and gross, it chose me, um, which is that I, I started, I, you know, in my romantic mind, I was always a novelist uh, in college, and then I graduated from Sarah Lawrence College with a... Really? Uh, a BA in the art of nothing, um, <laughs> which I, I realized... <laughs> Amazingly, like, you know, I, actually, I think Rolling Stone wrote about Sarah Lawrence College as, you know, the, the education that gives you, makes you really fun at cocktail parties, which, by the way, I am. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, my mother told me when I was 12, just learn to type fast and you will always have a job. And I was like, f you, mom, I'm not going to be a f secretary. Just cut to me at 22, like, thank God I can type fast. I'm a temp now. Um, but I just really, I just really was, you know, it's all about gay. It, it's the gay that brought me to this profession, which is that I was like, I, that there are no lesbian movies that represent me in my life. And so to my girlfriend, I, and who had just graduated from film school and was working in a university library, I said, you just graduated from film school. I'm a writer. Um, and I can type. 
I can type I fast. Can type. <laughs> and I have a day job now where I type a lot and there's <laughs> copy machines and like I can do, I can totally manage the behind the scenes of this. And so I said, let's make a movie uh, that represents us. And then we ended up making a movie. It took us two years and we broke up and it was drama. It was dyke drama. It was this, it was that. <laughs> people cried, people threatened, blah, blah, blah. But we made the movie and we had no idea that it would be that it would go to Sundance and then all of a sudden we would have careers as these people. I was like, I mean, when I wrote that screenplay, I had never read a screenplay. Like, I just really was like, how hard can it be? You walk into a room, people talk, and then they walk out, which if you see the movie, it's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than that, I've learned. Uh, except they have sex. So, so they walk in the room, they talk, sometimes they have sex, and then they walk out of the room. Um, what was that last part? <laughs> So, I mean, for me, and then all of a sudden we were, you know, we had an identity and a profile as these people. And so I was like, oh, I guess I better learn how to do this. Um, and so I learned, actually, I learned so much about it from being an actor for those first few years and reading so many scripts that came to me and being a critical eye and thinking, this is why this is good, this is why this is bad. And I, and I encourage any writer to read as many scripts as possible yeah. because mm -hmm. to be a critic is to understand your perspective right. and to understand your perspective is to be a good writer do you the yeah. one thing um, Teresa the do you, we were talking before about the idea that you're a better writer because of having acted that there's a symbiotic relationship rather than a competitive one for sure and yeah. like particularly I think the one thing that Second City gives us is you can you know this isn't gonna work yes. <laughs> like you're able to go oh no I've Logged yeah. hours on stage, so I can go. This isn't, you know. For sure, you know if you're advancing the story or not because right. you have almost in your DNA at that point from doing improv for 20 years of like, oh, this is going nowhere. <laughs> I can tell. Like, if I had an audience, they would be turning the channel. Like, it just you can tell what's working, what's kind of not working. You you know how to generate the game of the scene as right. well. Right. Um, at least you know for comedy, and. Um, and it's, it is like improvising for all the characters in your head and then just typing it up. It just, I couldn't believe how much it felt like that, like right. improvising. Um, and then for a comedy writer, it's so much, the, uh, you know, 90% of your day is improvising with nine or 10 other writers in a writer's room and rewriting the script together is improvising because you have to come up with jokes all the time or being on the floor or on the set, um, you're constantly improvising and coming up with jokes. So it's such like an amazing background for doing comedy writing. Mm -hmm. I'm also really interested to ask both of you, um, because I only, I've only worked in TV, I worked for two seasons on The L Word, and what I found so fun and satisfying about the second season is that these are actual people that I now know who live and breathe in the world. I also can see what they're capable of, what they're not capable of, and I'm writing for actual living people. And you guys have done that so much more than I, and I would love to hear you talk about that. Well, one thing oh. that's funny. <laughs> what? You, like, if you, um, it's maybe similar, like, t just the idea of, uh, you know, that it's all storytelling. I think that's kind of the common denominator in that acting and writing and directing, in my humble opinion, is all, is all writing, that, you know, in, in terms of what storytelling is. And so um, when I, I think, have been the most effective, I've kind of deferred to that goal as opposed to my usual toxic narcissism of like, <laughs> notice me, notice me. But one of the premises in, with Second City is to make the other person look good. And, oh, interesting. And, it, and it, it works best when you're not, you know, and that's why I think stand-ups have a horrible time improvising because they, that world by definition is kind of necessary narcissism because you're all alone. But, with, in terms of acting and writing on The L Word, what was that like? Like writing for yourself? Like in, how? Well, it was funny because uh, I actually auditioned for The L Word before I was hired as a writer. Because they were looking for a Guinevere type? <laughs> yes, someone, you know, like a Bob Hoskins, but not English and not old, you know? <laughs> um, uh, God rest I, his soul. I, I, all respect to Bob Hoskins. Um, I uh, auditioned, and there's nothing, so the writer-actor dichotomy 
Gem fellow Gemini, you understand, <laughs> like we are Geminis, it's one thing that makes it work, is that I, for me, going in to meet with the creator of the show, after I, I had auditioned for her, not once, but twice, because I auditioned once for one character and said to my agents, can I go back in for another character? Nope, nope, nope. And then you know, my friend was uh, producing the show and she said you should go in and talk as a writer and I was like, Ugh. It's so embarrassing. I'm not going to. <laughs> Why is everything gay, gay, gay? Like, I have more to say than Les. But she's like, get over yourself and go in. And so I went in, and you know, I'm just like, now I'm a writer. <laughs> like, just like, and then so I sat and I got hired and I sat in the writer's room and I'm just like, writing, talking, doing the writer's room thing. And then I'm like, are you fing kidding me? You're not going to ask me to be on this show? And it, I was like, sitting there just like, also an actor, but no, I'm a writer. Also an actor. People know me. <laughs> and, uh, and then finally she said, would you like to play this character? And I was like, yeah, no, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I didn't create the character. The character was actually created by Angela Robinson, who was also on the show at that time, who did Debs and Herbie Fully Loaded and works on Hung. And, oh. um, and you know, she's, uh, and also has been a friend of mine forever. And she actually, it was amazing that she created the character. And then she also wrote for the character. I never actually had to write for my oh, character no. for the first season. Second season, I'd be like, hmm, what could she? <laughs> what could I I just, you just can't. As a writer, you can't be like, I think Gabby would be in this scene. <laughs> um, so I just had to actually we keep like coming back to Gabby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though I would actually like genuinely, as a writer, would have thought Gabby would work in the scene. You just, I just feel like especially as a woman, back me up if you think that I'm just being all that way. <laughs> but I feel like if you're an actor and a writer, you have to like really separate those things out because people take you less seriously as a writer if you're also an actor because they think, oh, she's angling for this, she's angling for that, or she only writes because she wants to be seen. Right. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. That's a dynamic that I feel. So I try to always just be like, oh, I'm a hard no ass <laughs> writer. I don't give a shit. No, no. The, really, um, <laughs> it, SNL... You know, some of the actors wrote, and they always wrote for themselves. They never, I mean, my definition of a real writer at SNL would be somebody who wrote something for somebody else, you know, and they never, ever did that. And it's it a was, tenuous right. relationship. It really is. Yeah, you're right. Even for non-Geminis. <laughs> like, even for Virgos? Even for Aquarians. <laughs> um, do, which do you prefer? Like, if, like, I always think of acting as just oh, fun. You know? So fun. But I prefer, um, now I prefer writing because I don't have to care what I look like. I just, <laughs> you know, can eat all the snacks and craft service. And, uh, yeah, I, I just feel less nervous as a writer um, until I hand in a script and then I'm nervous. Do, and or have to and also, you, it's a far more powerful position to be in. You're actually creating something as opposed to, I think. Well, the only oh, thing that feels less powerful <laughs> is that you work three times the hours yeah, and get paid. True. One quarter of the One money. One quarter of the money. I literally, I, I, so. I'm going to just throw these stats out. I made three times, no, twice as much in a day as an actor as I made in a week as a writer oh. on the same show in the same year. Yeah. So it's great. Literally. And you, you know what's it. easy? Uh, you show up. Someone <laughs> makes you pretty. You sit around all day, and then they say, stand there, say that, stand there, say that. And you're kind of playing a bitchy version of yourself. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Three times as much money. <laughs> yeah, cha-ching. Yeah. Cut to me, like, pajamas, two in the afternoon. When's that script coming? I'm like, I don't right. know. What uh, did she say? Uh, my printer's not working. I'm yeah. alone. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. I remember doing, I forget what, what I was working on. Some I had a day on some show. And, and just, this was the perfect kind of microcosm of the macrocosm is, here's your trailer. Here's your fruit basket. Don't f***ing leave, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you child, right. unless, you know, somebody with a headset comes by who's your adult and takes I know, and I would walk onto the set because I'm like, there's everybody and they're like, you know, doing something that I wrote and everyone's like, what are you doing? Like all the crews, all, what are you doing on this side? I'm all, I'm, and they're like, well, it's 20 on Guinevere. Get back in your trailer, I'm like, no, not the actor cage. <laughs> uh, the, the children's table. Get out of here. Well, do you, um, what, what, in terms of the future, what do you think? Like, where, where, what, ideally, if a genie was to appear and go, 
Teresa, you can have anything you want. What would be, would you <sighs> maintain more of what you're doing, or would a quantum <laughs> leap into holograms? Um, I'd like to never leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> Lose the use of my arms and legs. Right, um, just to float in the pool. <laughs> um, uh, I think I, I actually would like to just. Um, not leave my house. <laughs> Send but seriously, scripts. I mean it. <laughs> I have no other answer. Uh, and uh, no, I, I, you know, I develop stuff uh, every couple years, so um, that would be fun. I'd like to gather all my friends over the years that I've worked with, mm -hmm. that I love to work with, and have a room full of them and do a fun show that we don't get notes on. <laughs> that would be great. That would be really great. Hashtag and have it at, no at CBS Radford, which is four minutes from my house. That's oh, nice. The best Studio drive City? Ever. Yeah, Studio City. CBS Radford is the best studio. It really it's is. Really cute. It's cute, yeah. They have a little coffee shop. And Mary Tyler Moore was yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, in ter one thing that I, about the L word uh, to me is, and maybe, I don't know if this was, it, uh, I could be wrong about this, but there was a kind of, um, I would say moral imperative or socially important. Like there was a kind of ministry of like... First lesbian show ever. I would say that that informed, like raised the stakes to a really kind of epic moment about... And do you think that was... First off, do you think that's true? And secondly, was that helpful or a huge hindrance or...? It was drama. Um, I, I, when I, when my friend Rose, who was exec producer and directed the pilot and went on to be a huge part of the show, when she asked me, when she said you should go in and meet the, the creator, not God, the um, <laughs> creator of the show, <laughs> um, and, and talk about writing, I was like, oh, lesbian, 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 lesbian. And she's like, seriously, this is a historic moment in LGBT visibility and representation it's gonna be on the air or not, do you wanna be a part of it and make sure that it's the best thing ever or don't you, Elms all? Okay. <laughs> we'll try, and it was, and, and it was an interesting uh, writer's room because there were you know 10 of us back in the fatty days where 10 people were in a writer's room, mm. and, um, and some of us were lesbians and some of us were not, and some of us were gay men and one of us was a straight man that Showtime made us hire. And, um, <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> he was just Boy. like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Boy, been there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so there, there, was a, there were politics and, then, and there were you know, issues of representation and thank God we had straight people in the room because sometimes we'd all just be like, blah, 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 yeah, and then my ex-girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody would be like, I have no idea what you women are talking about. We're right. like, okay, good, we need that because we need to actually yeah. be speaking to a wider audience. Right. And front-loaded um, with exposition so everybody... That was the thing, is that human, the really cool thing about the L word was like, oh, I can way relate to that. Right, I mean, that, and that, that was an interesting you know, complicated thing. It's like, are we speaking to our audience or are we trying to show the world that we're just like everybody else? And that, that, that's a sort of tenuous balance that, yeah, I'd be like, can everyone be trans and addicted to Oxycontin? <laughs> <laughs> She's all, season three, GT. <laughs> she didn't hire me back for season three. <laughs> but they did actually have a trans character on season three. I'm like, you're f***ing welcome. Yeah, you should get a residual for that. You should get a green envelope for that. That's the, the green money. envelope. That's oh my God! Tools. The green envelope is what comes from the Writers Guild when you know it's the money envelope. Yes. They make it green. It's, we, it's so and and the thing about it is, it can be five dollars or it can be fifteen thousand dollars. I've never gotten fifteen thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> that was a, a lawsuit. Shot. That was a lawsuit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it really is an amazing moment to go. <laughs> you know, I'm all like, it's green. <laughs> I know. Well, don't get I always excited. get a text from my husband who's right here that says green envelope. <laughs> and it's, it's so exciting. The, it's like in Pulp Fiction where they open the briefcase and there's light that comes up. Yeah. <gasps> but I, I actually use my green envelope like a lottery ticket. Like I'll just put it on my desk and be like, 
hello, green envelope. <laughs> because one time, 10 <laughs> years ago, I had stacks of bills before I knew what the green envelope was. And I was just ignoring, ignoring, and I just had that moment of like three weeks of bills. I'm like, I'm getting kicked out of the Writers Guild. My life sucks. The electricity is getting turned off. <laughs> I'm a fraud. Like just all the way down. <laughs> and, uh, and finally I was like, I'm facing the bills. And I opened up all of the bills and I thought that the green envelope was just you know, dues. Notice, right. Twenty-five thousand dollars. <gasps> there you Whoa. go. That was sitting on my desk See? for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Moral of that story: Open your mail, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's never happened again. Just by the way, like yeah, I'm not great. rich, but that's that was like one of those like money can buy you happiness. <laughs> wow. Do you guys remember when they sent the green a meeting for WGA for the strike in a green envelope? Yes, I do oh, remember that. S yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I worked with, do you know Adrian Winner? Yes. Uh, we were all talking about how horrible that was, and he goes, that was my idea. He was working at the D WGA on the strike. Just to make sure we all opened it. <laughs> yes, and we, we all just like threw stuff at him. And <laughs> It was, it was so funny to strike. Writers striking, which is just basically you're moving and then you recognize, hey, and you start talking right. and then the line, just, everybody spills out into the street. Oh, we have to march again. Right. It was the best yeah. shape any writer has ever been in, right. in L.A. Yeah. Yeah. Or sunlight or walking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, with now, so far, what, uh, Teresa, has been your favorite, most edifying experience in terms of writing, I assume writing? The, um, like I, this is a weird thing that came to my mind. I'm, I'm surprised it's this, but working with Andy Ackerman, who um, oh. directed Seinfeld, he was our director on Whitney, and I don't know. I was so I was so excited to work with him, and he's just such a lovely man. And I don't know. That was that was to me like I just loved um, that moment. Of you like were working, working with him as uh, as a writer, not an actor. I was a, yeah, I was a writer. Yeah, but but weirdly, we had re realized I had done an episode a million years before. Of Seinfeld, and, and now it seems like I'm just dropping like that. Back <laughs> when dropping. I was on Seinfeld. <laughs> I was, uh, five and under on uh, Seinfeld. And These don't cause you cancer, by the way. They don't, <laughs> and they're great. Um, but anyway, we realized we had worked together one day when I did that little scene on Seinfeld. But um, but I don't know why I don't know why that came to my mind because that doesn't seem like much. But I really. No, no. I, I, John Cleese was would... on an episode of. Whitney. Whitney, that was another thing, and then he said, whose joke is this? And it was mine. <gasps> and he loved it so much. I was like, oh, yeah. I, that was great. I yeah. spent a year working with John, and uh, I would save his phone messages. Yeah, the people from Michael. the show did that, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Michael, this is just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just play it over and over. <laughs> 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 John, please think I'm wonderful. <laughs> then I think my ex-wife erased it, <laughs> and that's why we're divorced. <laughs> Gwen, what what was your favorite experience? Um, I just was asked this question two days ago, so I have a, I, I, I hope not stale answer, but it is a goodie. Uh, on the L word, um, well, a, a thing about TV, as you both know, is that sometimes you're asked to completely rewrite something in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I and I like there's an episode of the Outward that I'm super proud of that my name is not on that I wrote page 1 rewrite in 24 hours wow. and it, which I to which I say it's all fun and games until someone gets an Emmy nomination. <laughs> oh. Um, we didn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was so I was busy doing that, like literally in like a glass box in the production office, blah, 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 trying to write it. And was all, is it done? Is it done? Is it done? Because it was like ready to go into pre in like two seconds. And um, they were shooting an, another episode that I had written. And my friend Mary Heron, who I did American Psycho and Betty Page with, was directing that episode. And it came over the walkie. She's like, they, they just said, uh, can somebody ask Guinevere? Do, uh, Mary wants to know. Does she mean literally a blue dolphin dildo? Or was, that, was she just saying that for a fact? And I was all, tell her it's a real thing. Tell production to find one. <laughs> that was a high point. And <laughs> I'm like, I mean it. I've seen it. It's not sexy. <laughs> Please don't fuck me with a dolphin. <laughs> Good, good words to know and grow by. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're laughing and learning something. 
Um, <laughs> would the, now, in terms of like those moments, were there like what was the most ed edifying like staff situation that you were in, where the you were respected? For me, I, this may sound well, maybe not surprising. It was Sesame Street because <laughs> they asked us to work at the height of our intelligence, and every other show that I worked right. on went. <laughs> Listen, can you, no. <laughs> yeah, the audience, they're not, America's yeah. not going to understand that. I, yeah, I was always like, you know, like, listen, those idiots in Ohio. And then, <laughs> you know, I would, I'm from Ohio, and I would go home, and my family would go, why is your show so stupid? <laughs> I, I, like it's Ohio is mentioned a lot in writer's rooms yeah. as, like, the barometer. Yeah. People are going to get it. It's true. Ohio is the go-to re uh, state, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, which my, is so depressing. I, and Cleveland fun. would be the go-to re city, which is where I'm right. from. <laughs> and uh, I believe that the license plate should read, rather than the heart of it all, it should be a great place to leave. <laughs> <laughs> like, but uh, in terms of, was it the L word? For, like in terms of being respected and appreciated or... And also asked to write something in 24 hours, I guess. Well, I love that just because I love a ticking clock. As you know, as we all know, as, as writers, that's what you have to have. And I yeah. literally had a ticking clock. Um, no, I mean, TV for me was really hard because I've come from film and I've gone back to film in which you can take another week to really <laughs> find it. <laughs> and right. in TV, it's like, bitch, write it, or there's a line <laughs> yeah. around the block for your job. Moving. Yeah. <laughs> like, that we're right. shooting it, and, and so I learned actually so much from writing in TV uh, about like, get it done, don't be so precious. Right. But I also learned a, like a weird, I don't know if I love it, whatever feeling, which is like, know that whatever you put out there is gonna be mediated, moderated, changed, morphed, and it's not uh, in your control. So I would say things, and then I would say, oh wow, that, I love that idea. And then I'm like, oh, well now you just made it a mediocre concept. Right, right. And so that's a, that was for me just not, I, mean, like I always collaborate right. with one person or I write alone. And so, and so for me, it was very, it was a huge challenge, but also a huge lesson in right. how much to give in a room. Right. Because it, when you don't have control. Because I've been lucky enough in my film work to be right with directors or write on my own where I'm predominantly, what I say is, is, is a letter and if you if someone gives me notes it's up to me to implement them in some way whereas in tv it's like anyone could just rewrite done whatever and there's your name and there are some words that maybe people will blog about and call you racist right which happened to me <laughs> oh that sucks <laughs> well the um my, i mean my the room depends upon like who's running it and all that but the, it, it was always brutal uh, for me it was and then i'm really bad at that strategizing okay if he says this and you know so it's I'm I'm always shooting myself in the foot by giving too much away which is exactly what you were saying and like how do I parcel this out and make it go my way and it's one of those yet another definition of powerlessness like, you know. <laughs> it is hard you can be totally the, you know just from the machine and the notes and all of it it gets re rewritten to a point where you don't recognize it and your name's on it and yeah you're like, oh well, I liked my draft. <laughs> I liked so my, did everybody else in this room, but then it gets... My first week, so I like, I absolutely hate to be interrupted. I totally just interrupted you, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I'm Italian. I hate to be <laughs> interrupted, and so when people interrupt me, I just go like this. <laughs> like, and wait for them to notice that I'm not talking anymore, <laughs> which they rarely do. But in the writer's room, so my first week, I was just like, I'm not gonna talk anymore. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh yeah, you're actually just not doing your job if you're not talking and interrupting other people. And so it also helped me to develop that, like this weird sort of dance that you do with, with everyone where you like know when to interject and you know when yeah. to pull back. Oh, man. And yeah, you know when to hard. build on people. Especially I mean, it's 10 people. It's super fun actually, but it's like, it's exhausting. It's a whole different kind of exhausting than sitting there by yourself. Yeah, right. well that's what I didn't uh, anticipate with writing and being in the room all day. It's like you're at, a dry cocktail party all day. <laughs> you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> so you're so exhausted at the end of the day, and your brain is working all day. So it's just it's so you know after a twelve hour day of being in the room and you know pitching and everyone pitching, it's it is draining. It, it's surprisingly. Yeah. And to and there are toxic personalities like yeah. having worked on a couple of Chuck Lorre shows. Those I was we were saying before that shows tend to be, in my opinion. 
um, either you, like what makes you stay late? Either the love of what you're doing or the absolute fear of, you know, and the Chuck Lorre shows are phenomenally fearful based, you know, I don't know where he came up with the formula, but <laughs> you, nobody is happy. That's the other thing. A cr you know, four right. separate shows, nobody's happy doing them at all. They're, they're we had on the L Word, the first season, we, our second season, we had a writer from ER, and uh, Elizabeth Walker is her name, and we were, me and Rose were sort of bitching about like whatever politics that happen when you put 10 people in a room all day every day talking and she was like are you guys f kidding me she's like I worked on ER for two years everyone somebody would cry every day in that room oh my god and we were like what she's all you guys are pussies <laughs> <laughs> so all, I'm, I think that was mean <laughs> <laughs> so like and then we realized oh my god this is actually a this lovely a writer's room, room. Yeah. yeah yeah that you like, yeah you can get if you get one or two people especially if they're at the top then it's it's a tough that's it's you know because you're like in a slumber party with everybody you know or a submarine and it's just you know you have to deal with those people every single day for hours it, and hours and the thing too with you like not so much the film work, although I want to ask a couple of questions about that, but the, the idea of a showrunner and the requirement of a writer to kind of crawl inside their head, figure out what they want, offer up suggestions like as spontaneous and have them embraced is kind of, like you say, exhausting. It's like, like a permanent audition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say far more severe than real auditions. Yeah. Like you, because the beginning, middle, and end to an audition. Yeah, and it's just what, you know, two minutes at the most. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the, the, yeah, I've, but, I've... But great rooms are just, you can't duplicate. Like, yeah. that is just pure joy, being in a room full of great comedians and great writers. And What's your best room? It's so fun. Um, I've, had, I've been lucky that I've had a lot of good ones. Um, I think one of the Whitney rooms was really fun. I won't say which season. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, and th both seasons were really fun and and fun people. Uh, the Loop was fantastic. I don't know if anybody remembers this show about the uh, that took place in the Loop, but um, for Fox, and that was a really fun. I mean, I'm still like we still have Loop dinners of the writers, um, oh. and um, <laughs> I used to. I, I remember uh, in L.A. I would get together the first Monday of every month with all these jaded SNL writers, <laughs> and it was the most toxic evening <laughs> in the world to just have these angry guys screaming, you know, and I made the mistake once of going, I don't know, I kind of like Carrot Top, <laughs> two, three, four, <laughs> and uh, that, I mean, that, that they obviously, you, I think I got radiation poisoning, actually, from... <laughs> I'm so yeah. curious to know, like, so 30 Rock is ostensibly a representation of the SNL writer's room to a degree. Can you just, like, describe uh, a, a day in the writer's room at SNL? Oh, um, well, I was there in the late 1500s. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I was very scared. I was 24, 20, 24, 25, 26, and uh, I was scared to death of New York, but I like Bronxville. I dated somebody from West Sarah Pinefield. Lawrence. Oh, from West Pinefield. Okay. <laughs> it's and, one of the colleges that I went to. Yep. And, uh, but uh, it, was, it was either, like in the course of a day, say a 12-hour day, you would be lied to and then apologize. <laughs> lied to, apologize. It was just accelerated what kind living. kind of lies? I'm so curious. We're going to use your stuff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I meant to tell you we're not. <laughs> we're going to use your stuff. Like, you know, the clock, three o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. But so, did that matter that much in terms of, you know, your job or what was going to happen to you in the next day, whether or not they use your material? I mean, you're generating material every week and you have a contract well, the, for like the whole season, right? Well, my, my thing, like, and still is, in fact, I'm working with Second City and DePaul right now on this thing called Wait a Minute. And uh, it's always been news driven, topical, political stuff. And so, I love that. Like you were saying about the clock, you know, like racing clock, against yeah, time, yeah. and there was nothing more exhilarating. But it, it was just amazing to have like very neurotic people, which is what that is a group of world class. You could do a seminar. It made a you swear. Oh, what? 
<laughs> I've you never. I was like, I can say. I've, <laughs> I've never done people. it before. <laughs> First time. Big black Catholic mark on me now. <laughs> but they, it, you know, so to take those kind of um, amped uh, weirdos and you know, and create a situation where publisher perish and the worst experience for me, and I'll shut up, is no, was dress rehearsal. All the writers sat in a room and watched dress rehearsal, and there's three extra scenes. So three, one, three writers are going to get cut, or you know, three scenes will get cut, and just the 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 level that fairly nice talented people will sink to <laughs> in terms of getting their piece of time on the what air. What does it look like? It was like a shark fest. No, I mean like blowjobs. Like I mean, like, <laughs> like what, what level do people sink to? <laughs> I know I wish. That people think blowjobs happen more than they do in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> it's not happening. I know blowjobs with ice. <laughs> that's, really that, that's in a contract. Um, <laughs> In, That's in a in little, the trailer for we. Uh, I'm gonna just finish up, and then I'm going to come to you, pretty <laughs> we people. Finish on for blowjobs with ice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'd make a great again, show. Blowjobs, blow again, jobs on ice. If we've done nothing, <laughs> we've made you laugh and made you learn stuff. <laughs> so know that. Um, I. Uh, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, open the floor to questions if you have any. Um, I can't see. Oh no, I can. Look at that. Like a, an oil painting with you guys moving. Oh, you have microphones too, right? Please. Hello. Hi. Cool. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, greatly appreciated. Um, <clears throat> my question is uh, based on the whole, uh, you know, writers who direct and produce. Um, what what kind of uh, let's say advice can you give um, somebody who is an aspiring director who wants to write his own material? And, and, and kind of put himself out there and, and kind of get noticed. What kind of advice can you lend to kind of making that happen? Um, again, I'm a director aspiring, and I'd like to transition into writing uh, and eventually write and direct my own product, uh, projects. Well, the great thing is now you can do it for so little money yeah. and put it on the internet. And, you know, even doing a short for Funny or Die can get you noticed or, you know, any of those websites, um, College Humor, and I don't know, or if you're doing dramas, you can put it on there. I don't know the sites for that, but um, and you can do shorts, and you can you know do it so easily on your own. I would suggest that write it, do it, get you know the best actors that you know of, your friends, um, and shoot it and put it up. And and but also, I would say that if your instinct is a director, and then you want to write. Just really examine what, where, what, how you feel about those two things because finding great material that you can direct the shit out of may, might be better than focusing on writing when, how you feel as a director. Like it's, I think it's important to really focus on who you are creatively. And many people are both, and many people are great at this, and many people are great at this. And So I, I also would encourage you to think about maybe searching out material that inspires you as a director. If, because very rarely do directors go that way. Writers sometimes go that way and um, everybody can do everything that they want to do, but I just I think it's an interesting thing to examine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know many that have a director suddenly going, "You know what? I want to write." That's interesting. I think everything is based on um, kind of precedent. I mean, like the idea of building um, and and the other thing I champion at least in my classes is failing. Like I think that's a great thing to Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try it and fail and learn and and on and and, uh, and your story is phenomenally inspiring of learning to type and then writing a yeah. script <laughs> in two years and and by no no kind of acumen you accidentally hit the mother load with like yeah shooting just in skeet. a moment and that's the other thing is obviously it's it's it seems like a cliche but just be passionate be be sure that you're doing it for the right reasons I feel like that's gotten me really far and in my my professional life, when I've strayed from that and taken jobs because I just needed to pay the rent, I have been a pathetic writer who didn't do, make her deadlines and hated myself. Yeah. I would rather live in my car. Yeah. So be willing to live in your car is really what I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's the take. So get a Thank car. you very much. <laughs> Anybody else? 
Um, oh, here we go. Hi, my name's Marie. Um, Two-part question. First, I heard that like in sitcoms, it used to be where writers' rooms had like 10 to 14 people. What's the average nowadays? Mostly 10. I would say most of the shows I've worked on have been 10. I've been, I've been on a show where there were only four of us. Um, and on How I Met Your Mother, we got up to 15. Usually we break off into two groups if there's 10 or more. Um, and you have, you know, it's a, very efficient then. You have one room rewriting the, the current script, the next one working on the next one. Um, so it, um, that's the average 10, I would say. Okay. Second part, if you end up writing in a show and it, turns into, and it happens to be a toxic room, how do you keep from getting sucked into being into that toxicity? Quit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's a great question, though. Um, I mean, one thing I, uh, I mean, not to. Um, I always blared music on the way home. That always helped. Taekwondo me. is what I was going to say. Taekwondo. I took ta Taekwondo. Um, Drink heavily. Drinking. <laughs> yeah. And. Um, then go to rehab and meet somebody and develop a show. <laughs> <laughs> Promises yeah. in Malibu. I mean, it's just like anything. What, you know, if you deal with people in your life, I mean, we all have families, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody toxic there, and you like have there to go to Thanksgiving. There will always be a family member in <laughs> yeah. there, in that room. So I don't, you know, for me, it's it's really about like eyes on the prize. Yeah, you kind of have to just keep focusing on work, keep resetting every day, um, just like in any other field where there's a boss or somebody that that you don't click with or that are being difficult <laughs> I just kind of steer clear and and kill them with kindness and get out of there as it is a very there. funny moment when you try you know like with me going home for family reunions and I'm so misunderstood they're not gonna do my <laughs> scene and you know and I'm looking at a room full of steel mill workers going F you idiot yeah. boy. <laughs> <laughs> what you've never worked a day in your life <laughs> I could tell dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. When you come home and, and everybody has the people at work that they are, you know, they have conflicts just like you do. And, you know, then you realize, oh, well, we have great jobs, you know, and, and that makes it worth it. And One of my favorite moments uh, in that when my sister was 13 and my first film came out, she, she told me she had a slumber party. And um, our film, well, I was in Newsweek for some reason, and she said, I mean, for the movie, but she said, like, one of the girls at her slumber party was like, um, uh, you need to stop talking about your sister because if she's so famous, why haven't I heard of her? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, um, uh, she's famous because she's in Newsweek. <laughs> and she said the girl just cried and went home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm super famous now. <laughs> Girls are crying about me at slumber parties. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's, a, that's when you know you've made it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, like, a catchphrase on a business card makes girls cry. <laughs> <laughs> Call me. We have another question? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Justin. Um, I have a question, kind of. I think this is more poised at uh, Genevieve, but if anyone else wants to help out, then this, that would be good. Um, so, how was sort of the experience of writing the screenplay for American Psycho? different from being in the writer's room for the the L word. Um, were those very different experiences in which would you say that one was better than the other? Um, I almost developed an eye twitch while you were asking that question. <laughs> um, I, I meant that literally. I don't know why. Um, uh, the difference is one is an adaptation of a novel, so you're dealing with actual material, mm -hmm. and it's just me and one person, the director who I trust and is a good friend. And also, it's a genre that I absolutely hate. Like I actually don't like scary movies at all. I can't even look at a poster for a Saw movie. I get totally have nightmares. So that was like a whole, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's almost like speaking Italian and French. The idea of ad adapting a novel to the screen versus being in a writer's room where you're just making shit up. <laughs> from a lot, from people's experiences, straight or gay, and just, you know, like that's writing a soap, that's writing a satirical horror movie. So just apples and oranges. Um, they, they they develop different writer muscles for me. Mm. Which do you, do you, I would, screenwriting or not to, which do you prefer? Uh, you make a lot more money if you work in TV. 
So I like that. <laughs> green envelopes. Um, the, the green, green envelopes. envelopes. Although the American Psycho gave me a couple of those. Um, I prefer, I don't know, I'm just, I'm a super social animal. Like the, the, the environment of the writer's room to me is so fun. It's kind yeah. of like high school or like being on the set. Yeah. Like you just, like I just love, I, I will just like watch someone and their weird habits. And like I won't stop <laughs> listening to what anyone is saying. I'm like, she just totally took her flip flops off. <laughs> and now she's putting them on the chair. She's wiggling, wiggling, wiggling her toes. Her hands are really weird. Oh my God, she's eating an almond. And I'll be like, okay, wait, what was happening? <laughs> I love that, actually. I live for that. Uh, you know, the, you remind me, uh, I remember reading that Richard Curtis, the. Um, Love Actually and Four Weddings and a Funeral, parcels his year out, half of it working in TV with a staff because he loves the community, and then half of it screenwriting. The, the, the exact kind of best of both worlds, very similar. I feel that. I mean, that to me is, it, it is the best of both worlds because there's fun to be had in both, and yeah. I'm a little skitzy, <laughs> so. I, I'm right there with you. <laughs> uh, I see that uh, we have no light over there, so we don't have any more questions. And Kristen is bathed in, you look like a Catholic <laughs> saint. Yes, <laughs> the blonde hair Ooh. flowing. <laughs> um, just to finish up, uh, one thing very quickly, because I think we're running out of time. And again, thank you guys for coming. And way thank you guys for thank you guys. more than anything. <laughs> and may, maybe this is a bad last question, but I'm just personally curious as to what you think the future of t TV might be, having both worked in television. Like, is it going to be more of the same, or is it going to... Well, you were thinking that reality is going to go away a little bit, right? Not to speak for you, <laughs> from the green, green room, but... No, I was like, I just wanted to be on Millionaire Matchmaker real quick, in case reality TV <laughs> goes away. In case it goes away. <laughs> Side note. You have more Catch wisdom. Catch re-airing of match <laughs> Millionaire Matchmaker. It's a whole other story. No, you, you talk. You know more about it than I do, TV-wise. Um, I, I kind of think it's going to go the opposite, where there's going to be even more reality. I mean, every year there's more and more, and um, How many that's times scary. can Andy Dick get sober? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I don't want him to get sober, because he says he's only gay when he's drunk. <laughs> it's one of my favorite quotes ever. That's such a lie. <laughs> <laughs> he's gay when he's sober, too. <laughs> I'm gonna, no, but you know what excites me about the future is that Amazon is now a channel. Yes. And right. that Netflix is now a channel, and that Hulu is now a channel, and that that's gonna keep happening until there's so many more platforms that can take more risks right. uh, beyond network and beyond cable, but that can really go out there. I feel like it's actually an exciting world for new writers and new creators. That's true. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And on, to piggyback on Teresa's thing, I think, particularly you guys, um, you know, that Marxist thing, which isn't communist at all, but the workers controlling the means of production, you can shoot it with your iPhone and edit it on your MacBook Pro and do it, as opposed to, meh. I mean, it really is, yeah. it is kind of a, sh <laughs> we live in a shut up and dance era. Yeah. You know, and, and your thing is so inspiring, the idea of, you know, going from secretary typing to film typing. <laughs> I'm going to always just, always think of you going yes. like that. I'm writing, I'm writing. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Thank you all again. Uh, good luck and have a great day. <laughs>